Uh, and honestly, I, I, I can't say enough good things about the students who work to put this on and put it together. Uh, if, if you have any interest at all in supporting them and this effort, which we hope to keep going long after I'm done uh, with the lecture series, please do support them. Uh, that said, tonight I'm going to make some references to uh, Ecological Reflections, which was the lecture series from the spring. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with that lecture series, um, my publisher and friend Ross Tengadol uh, sent one of his students here with copies of that book, and, uh, and because uh, I want you to have the information more than we want money, they're $5 tonight as well. So if you didn't get one the first night, uh, the kickoff, or if you want additional copies to like inundate your family with them, uh, grab them on your way out. They're, they're $5 straight cash. We'll, we'll work out the taxes on our own. Uh, so that, that because it, it's going to come up. Having said that, um, I'm, I'm going to caveat tonight's lecture a little bit by saying that this is the most out on the limb I've pushed the envelope with this lecture series to this point. Uh, so it's a little longer uh, than normal. Uh, so just bear with me as I work through this because it's going to it's going to require a little bit more thoroughness than what we usually do before we get to the Q&A. Um, and uh, if you know me, you know that this lecture is radically different than the ones normally because tonight there will be technology. Uh, this is going to become necessary. So I'm going to, I'm going to work through uh, the argument uh, that's going to sort of take what we did two weeks ago and move it uh, toward what I think is a better understanding of our environmental situation. Could you talk as loud as possible? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going I'm to try to disturb his attempts to do his homework, so we'll okay. see. All right. All that being said, uh, tonight's lecture uh, is slightly different, uh, and it's titled the ones on the, uh, the flyer that advertised the lecture. Uh, so tonight, the, the lecture is actually officially titled The Nature of Domination and the Creatures on the Margin. Strangers are, as we have discussed previously, like us, but unlike us just enough in important ways to present an unsettling moment, to raise our interactions with them to a level of discomfort which compels us to orient ourselves to the world in particular ways. Peeling back another layer of our relationship to other beings uh, brings us to creatures. Creatures represent a relationship of dissonance both in ourselves and to the world. Creatures are beings whose being is similar to ours in recognizable ways, but significantly different in other ways, where, unlike strangers, we understand that similarity to be ontological and not necessarily material. Perhaps it's best to sum this up by pointing to the relationship you have with your cat or your dog, maybe a horse or a bird, I don't know what kind of pet you're into. Right. In animals, we recognize a kinship born of similarity, but it is a kinship of discord. Let me extend the analysis a little bit uh, to help us understand what I mean by uh, a kinship of discord. Though we often fail miserably to show a full and proper moral account of our fellow human beings, we easily understand that human beings, strangers to us or not, are moral beings. Knowing this and failing to act in our own lives according to a uh, moral standard with respect to those people leaves us wrestling with a continual moral failure. Think of the Yemeni genocide. You know what's happening. You're not really doing anything about it. Most people aren't. It's an egregious moral failing and yet we somehow live comfortably in a world where this occurs. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. We allow the less fortunate to starve and to suffer and to die alone. We allow for the murder and pillaging and rape of innocent people, cultures, and ecosystems in the name of profit. As we have discussed previously, we consume not just more than our share, but more than we need. We have moral failings woven into the tapestry of our lives so thoroughly that we have become comfortable living with them. But even to the most obtuse and callous individual, these are still recognizable wrongs. Toward our pets, we're able to muster a similar level of concern. 
often elevating that concern to a moral worldview that acknowledges the moral status of animals that we recognize as companions. Which is why we find the dog meat festival in Southeast Asia to be abhorrent, while many in China do not. There, canines are livestock. We have a much harder time doing so with those things that we have categorized as pests. Still, the moral jury remains out on the moral standing of animals. Thinking back to our previous discussions, if we ought to alter our consumption patterns to account for others, giving animals moral standing equitable to our own would mean further recognizing our failure as moral beings and making more acute changes to our consumptive relationship to the world. Here I want to argue that what I am calling our existential crisis actually precedes our existential crisis precisely because of what these two explanations pick out as the heart of our individual and cultural malaise. For the existentialist, our problem is one of struggling to find purpose amid profound meaninglessness. But this seems to follow from a more problematic relationship to existence that develops out of disharmony. Here we will want to journey back to the rupture of humankind from other kinds. To do that, we will need to consider the foundational creation mythology of Western culture. Adam as that mythology's main character, and Adam's existential crisis. In the beginning, so we are told, primeval divinity created ex nihilo, all that is, and perhaps, there is something to be said of being fashioned from nothing that has left an indelible and unmistakable stain upon creation, which points us in the direction of both a deeper understanding of God as fallible and toward ourselves as hopelessly marred by dark desire. That is, it may turn out that creation is the original sin, and the question that remains is whether or not we can be redeemed through our own efforts. So let us consider then life after creation. On the sixth day, before God could pronounce everything good, there was a hiccup in the perfection of creation. Adam could not find a suitable companion among the inhabitants of Eden. When God created Adam, he said, let us create him in our image. We can table the us aspect and wonder at what image God created Adam in, that Adam was understood to not need a companion. All the other creatures in Eden had reproductive companions, but we do not get the sense that Adam was looking for Nookie. Rather, there, is, there was a companionship that the other, excuse me, other inhabitants of Eden clearly had access to. That God was compelled to fashion from Adam a counterpart for this purpose suggests that creation of on completion to God's satisfaction was in fact unsatisfactory and incomplete from Adam's perspective. The critical aspect of this story is that Adam, who was made from the same formless nothingness that all of creation was brought forth from, could not find a counterpart in all of creation in spite of their similarity. No being in all of Eden was compatible to Adam. This is, at least in part, reinforced by the fact that God grants Adam dominion over all the beasts, fishes, and fowl, so that even though they are all integral parts of creation, their ontological connection is more tenuous. So tenuous, in fact, that the dissonance between the creatures of creation required an addendum to creation. I would draw your attention back to the discussion in Ecological Reflections, for a more thorough discussion of just what Adam's role in dominion was or could have been, and today how we should interpret it. I don't want to rehash that, it's in the book. Right? We can talk about it in the QA if we need to. Of course, there is the lingering problem of Adam's first counterpart, Lilith. The interpretation of the biblical text suggests that God created a man and a woman from the dust when he finally got around to creating Adam. This female is unnamed in the text and is very quickly glossed over in favor of Eve in the next chapter, chapter 2. Uh, that there was discord between Adam and Lilith is the story presented in the Alphabet of Ben Sura, which is a Judaic text, part of the Talmud, uh, Talmudic tradition. Lilith makes the claim that having been fashioned from the same stuff as Adam, she should be given fair treatment and consideration. 
One of the key sticking points is her insistence that she not always have to be on the bottom during sex. I point this out because it problematizes the idea that Adam was in the market for a companionship that was not merely reproductive. However, if you read the full account of Lilith's engagement with Adam, uh, then we can grant the story's premise that the two argued about other things as well. And then it is reasonable to assert that the discord in Eden found its primary locus not in Adam's unwillingness to explore the Kama Sutra, but in his stubborn refusal to acknowledge Lilith's equality at the level of both material and ontological being. Presumably, this problem supervenes on Adam's choice of a companion after the departure of Lilith because he could not find common ground with the beings that God fashioned for him. So how was he supposed to do so with the creatures he had been given dominion over? Adam's existential crisis begins at the point where he refuses to see himself as a part of Eden, or more broadly, as an equal member of the biotic community. If Adam's existential crisis begins after he eats forbidden fruit, it's safe to say his existential crisis was already in full swing by that point.